Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and this episode is Q&A number 62. Before we get into today's questions, as usual, let's thank our sponsors. First, we have Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Precision Hydration make electrolyte products to help you get hydrated and stay hydrated. Because hydration is not just about replacing the fluid that you lose, but also you need at some point to replace some of the electrolytes that you may lose, especially sodium, in your sweat. And when workouts get longer and hotter, so for example, many of you will be doing that those kinds of workouts during your indoor bike sessions this time of year, but some of you in the southern hemisphere might be approaching racing season, and the races are uh, the really the most critical parts where you really need to think about whether you are adequately replacing the sodium lost so precision hydration they have products and they have information including blog articles a free hydration test that you can take online to figure out roughly how much sodium you lose etc so go check them out and if you want to try your first box or tube of precision hydration product for free use the promo code that triathlon show all one word all caps and uh, it's all yours Also, big thanks to Roka that you can find on roka.com. They make wetsuits, trisuits, swimskins, goggles, buoyancy shorts, and high-performance eyewear that uh, are really top quality. I love their products, and uh, in particular, I have to say that the Maverick X wetsuit is my favorite, uh, just because for a weak swimmer like myself, it feels like it transforms me into uh, into a pretty half-decent swimmer when I put that wetsuit on, and uh, not all wetsuits do that for me. I I definitely always like swimming in a wetsuit more than without, but uh, with the Maverick X wetsuit, it's got uh, an additional uh, factor that for some reason seems to be making me, giving me a few extra seconds per 100 meter, and uh, that uh, ends up making a pretty significant difference over the course of a race. But you can check out any of Roka's products and you might be doing your Christmas shopping. Roka is a great way to start that if you're buying gifts for triathlon friends. And you can get uh, 20% off your entire order with the promo code TTS, all caps. So let's get into the first question from today, which is from uh, Bertrand in Belgium, who writes, Hi, Michael. I was quite intrigued at the time by your episode on sprint interval training with uh, Jérôme Corral as I'm more of a volume guy and I'd like to give give sprint interval training a try. I'm focusing more on the bike right now with uh, a more relaxed approach to training and no super early wake-ups and so on. Thus, having super short runs three times per week would be welcome to help fit everything in. I would keep at least one long run on top of it, most likely two. My question, is the off-season a good time to implement this sprint interval training protocol? Okay, thank you so much, Bertrand, for your question. Uh, let me start first for those that uh, do not remember what sprint interval training is by briefly describing it. Uh, basically, it's very simple. Uh, they are 30-second all-out efforts. And uh, typically, and especially in the protocol that uh, Jérôme Corral uh, talked about, that they had done in their studies, you would do four to seven times 30 seconds with long recoveries, and they would typically use four minutes rest. But it can be anywhere from, let's say, three to six minutes of rest. And that would be very, very easy recovery, just very slow jogging mixed with walking, probably, if you're doing uh, the run sprint interval training protocol. And on the bike, you might be just soft pedaling at 40 to 50 percent of of ftp or something like that just something that feels super easy and uh, in the example by jerome corral in episode 151 that i'll link to in the episode description uh, the first week the subjects would be doing four of these 30 second all-out sprints and then they would gradually increase each session or each week i can't actually quite remember because they did a few of these sessions per week three of them i believe uh, so they would gradually increase to five, then six, and then finally seven. And that's how, as far as it, as they went. So to answer your question now that we have described this and everybody remembers what we're talking about and knows what we're talking about with sprint interval training, 
I would say that this all depends on your objectives and what you want to accomplish during this time of year and with this type of training. So if the objective for you is it's an interesting and fresh kind of training that can reinvigorate you and keep motivation high and and still give you at least some high intensity training benefits, then absolutely go for it. If the objective is to maximize the effectiveness of the time that you are willing to spend on running during this time of year, you mentioned that you would like to keep the runs at 30 minutes. And uh, if the objective is to maximize that time, then to me, the jury is definitely still out on if this is the most effective way to do it. And uh, personally, I would say that I would choose some other options in most cases. Don't get me wrong. I do use sprint interval training sometimes with some athletes. But that is generally if I want to improve their anaerobic capacity. And that may or may not be a priority for you, depending on your uh, strengths and weaknesses, your goal races, and the time of year, obviously. So if you're not focusing on improving your anaerobic capacity, then my inclination would be that you can make better use of that runtime with some other protocols than sprint interval training. Uh, I simply don't think that the evidence holds up for it yet when compared with other types of intervals. It doesn't mean that it can't improve uh, other aspects of your fitness than the anaerobic capacity. Uh, It can, uh, it has in some studies, but I'm just not convinced that it's better than some other types of, of training that you could be doing, like long and short VO2 max intervals, uh, and those I or P- Professor Paul Larson uh, described in episode 163, for example, which is called Intro Training, Science and Application. I'll link to that as well in the show notes. But even a type of training like threshold training might be more effective or is probably more effective when it comes to uh, aerobic improvement as opposed to anaerobic. Or at least, again, this is all my opinion because... I don't think that there are many, if any, studies that have directly compared these types of training protocols. So that's that's why it's always difficult to say, and and it's often very anecdotal. But even with the constraints of having 30 minutes to run, I don't think that you are limited to just sprint interval training. Uh, So the examples that I would give you for different types of workouts that you could do, and this is if we're talking actual high intensity workouts or quality workouts and we're not just talking 30 minutes of easy running uh, but some some examples that i would give you includes first a workout consisting of 10 minutes of warm-up and then 20 minutes at your threshold this is a classic jack daniels run 20 minutes of running at your threshold and the second example would be a type of workout that is described as long intervals by Professor Paul Larson and Martin Boucher, the authors of uh, uh, the science and application of high intensity interval training. And that would be, again, we would do a 10 minute warm up and then we would do five sets of three minutes hard, one minute of walking. Simple as that. Uh, three minutes hard can be your 5K run pace, roughly. And then the final example would be what uh, Larson and Boucher would uh, call short intervals. And then again, we would do a 10 minute warm up and then 20 sets of 30 seconds hard, 30 seconds jogging. And the 30 seconds hard could again be uh, roughly 5K, 5K pace or slightly faster than 5K pace. So you, or perhaps if you have a coach, then you and your coach need to determine what your current priorities and training objectives are and work backwards from that. And only then can you really know whether sprint interval training makes sense or not. And uh, again, there isn't really any research directly comparing sprint interval training to other training protocols. So uh, just because I think that generally the examples that I just gave might be better, unless you're working on anaerobic capacity, that does not mean that it's categorically correct or that's the way it is. Uh, Trial and error can lead to great successes. So you could do a whole lot worse than giving it a try for a month and just simply see how it works. But that's my take on on it, so I hope that that helps you, Bertrand. The second question for today is from Olivier in Switzerland, who writes, Hi Michael, I've started to listen to your podcast and uh, read your blog with high interest, as this is uh, perfectly matching my approach to triathlon. I would have a I have a question or would like your opinion regarding FTP, how to determine it and how it evolves with training. I started, like many of us, to follow the basic principles of Andy Coggan by performing a 20-minute test and then taking 95% of that as my FTP. Uh, This was done very early in the season with very low mileage, around 1,000 kilometers after several months 
with pretty much no cycling in winter. During this first test, I averaged 288 watts, so I went for an FTP of 275 watts. One month later, I showed up to the start of a 7.3 with uh, a total of 2,000 kilometers in the saddle, and uh, I went for an intensity factor of uh, 85%, so 230 watts. But after 40 kilometers, I realized that this was not going to happen, to happen, and I backed off to a pace that felt reasonable for such an event. I had been racing 70.3s for four seasons before, so I was not new to the distance and pacing. I ended up averaging 212 watts normalized power and had a very decent run after, but I felt pretty confused by the intensity factor of uh, 78%. Okay, so this is uh, Michael jumping in here, not the question. Uh, all of this, I think, is completely normal and expected. It totally matches what I see in most age group athletes. So back to the question. First take home. Probably averaging 85% of FTP is requiring a certain volume of endurance training. Second take home. 20 minute power, um, 95% of 20 minute power is probably overestimating FTP. Later on, based on some Olympic distance races closer to FTP effort, I narrowed down my FTP to being in the range of 92% of 20-minute power, so I adjusted my zones accordingly. And jumping in here again with a comment, I agree with both of your conclusions, and uh, indeed the 92% of 20-minute power works much better than 95%. Uh, I have I actually have a zones calculator, a Google spreadsheet that I'll link to in the episode description, and in that, I used 91%, but I did go back and forth between 91 and 92%. And quite honestly, you could go either way. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I have seen quite a few athletes who have done both lactate tests and 20-minute uh, tests, and uh, they ended up falling in the 92 to 93% range. Some ended up falling in the 90 to 91% range. So 92 should be totally fine. Back to the question again. Where I'm still a little bit confused and would be interested to uh, to learn your opinion is that my 20-minute power does not seem to vary. Basically, I did another 20-minute test at the end of the season and then at the beginning of this season and then at the end of my preparation for my first full Ironman distance in June this year. And my value was pretty much the same at 295 watts. So a very small increase versus my first very first test done with very low training. I've been always been doing the test on the same road, a 4 to 5% steady gradient, and trying to do it relatively fresh. Even if uh, big numbers are pleasing for the ego, that's, that's not the point. The point is that I know my performance level in races, times, and position uh, significantly improved uh, from that first 7.3 event last year. So maybe the point of the volume necessary to sustain a best level of intensity factor is still valid. Maybe 92% of 20-minute power as FTP is also valid. But why does my 20-minute power not improve despite training, fitness, and race performance being better? Have you noticed similar patterns on you or your athletes? Okay, Olivier, thank you for a great question. There are a few possible explanations for this. And uh, first off, and uh, probably a par- at least part of the answer to this question, is that even if your 20-minute power did not change a lot, that doesn't mean that your physiology didn't change. And uh, the backstory here, go and listen to episode 169 with Sebastian Weber, and he talks uh, in depth about this. But to give you the summary... Maybe at the start of the season, you averaged 288 watts at 88% aerobic and 12% anaerobic contribution. And uh, then later on, so for example, your most recent test, maybe you had an aerobic contribution of 93% and only 7% anaerobic contribution. So if we assume, I know that you improved to 295 watts, but for 288 watts, even if it would have stayed the exact same, if you went from 12% to 7%, as an example, then the very costly anaerobic contribution that you would have had decreased by 15 watts, from 35 watts anaerobic to 20 watts anaerobic contribution. And uh, likewise, obviously, your aerobic contribution went up by 15 watts. And uh, that increased aerobic contribution at 20 minutes 
will also be equally evident at lower intensities, which is why your race performances and general training performances have improved. And yes, this is something that I see quite a lot in, in my athletes that I coach and the athletes that I test using the inside testing protocol, where we can actually see these sorts of things, the contribution of anaerobic and, and aerobic power. And in that context, what we see is that uh, VO2 max, which is the aerobic capacity, it goes up. So you get a stronger aerobic contribution and VLA max or your glycolytic anaerobic capacity goes down which for long steady state racing at intensities below threshold is a good thing. So maybe the 20 minute power remains the same, but we know that these changes in physiology, an in improved VO2 max aerobic capacity and, and decreased VLA max or glycolytic anaerobic capacity, we know that all else being equal, these changes in physiology will lead to an improved race performance. So I would guess that this is what has happened to you. You started training more and that showed up in your general fitness and in your race performances. And this is because you improved your aerobic uh, contribution to powers at, at sub-maximal intensities. Uh, the training volume, increased volume and uh, maybe other aspects of the training also led to a decline in anaerobic capacity. And this is very common. It's uh, absolutely super common. It's uh, not a bad, necessarily a bad thing as I just described. The important thing is that you should now start to eventually see an improvement in your 20 minute power because your anaerobic capacity should reach a more stable level at your current training volume. And hopefully your aerobic capacity and aerobic contribution will keep going up. And in that case, your 20 minute power will also start to go up and improve. There is one other possibility that I can think of and uh, that is freshness. Even though you mentioned that you try to be relatively fresh, it can be quite common actually to feel quite fresh and recovered, but you might actually still be under far greater fatigue in your later tests compared to the earlier ones, simply because you have imp increased your training volume quite significantly and that too can have an impact. But again, it sounds like you are now at a pretty steady training volume for some time. So that should be evening out so that you could expect your future tests to be comparable with the last couple of tests that you've done and you should start to expect seeing improvements. So I hope that this helps and give you some ideas for what you might want to look for and think about. And that's it for today's Q&A. Thank you so much for all the great questions that keep coming in. Keep sending them in to michael at scientifictriathlon.com and that's Michael with a K. And if you enjoy the podcast, please remember to share it with your friends, with your uh, teammates, with your uh, racing uh, buddies and uh, anybody that you know of that could be interested in uh, great endurance sports content. And also, if you have a couple of minutes, a rating and review on iTunes or your podcast app of choice that allows rating and reviewing would be absolutely fantastic. And I want to take the opportunity to thank everybody that has already left a rating and review. There's a lot of you as well. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you also to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Get a free hydration plan and an, a ballpark estimate for how much sodium you lose in your sweat. And get your first box or tube of electrolytes for free with the promo code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roca.com. Check out their wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, and high performance eyewear, and get 20% off your entire order with the promo code TTS, all caps. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.